So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another week of live music here at the RGM Experience Podcast with me, the host, Carl Maloney. How are you doing? You all right, guys? And I've got another legend on his hands today, ladies and gentlemen. I've got the wedding presence, David Gedge. Hi, mate. How are you doing? Hello. I'm very well. Thank you. How are you? I'm fine, mate. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's, it, it's very much a pleasure to have somebody that, uh, you know, your music's been around my life for all of it. And on, on a recent podcast i had miles hunt on um and the, the the wedding present first was presented to me by a friend when i was 13 at school they gave me a box of tapes uh, and it had eight leg groove machine in it and i'm trying to remember if it was sea monsters or george best by you guys and i can't quite remember which one it was it's not coming to me right. um so that's you know that was back 90 when were I? I'm born in 78 i was 13 ish 14 ish so early 90s anyway so, you know, the band's been around a while, mate. You know, how do you reflect back on those times and um, how do you look back on and reminisce over the early days? Uh, it's weird because, I, you know, I don't, you know, people say that and I, I start counting the years and thinking, wow, that, it's a long time ago. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like getting to 40 years when I you know, first started to be in you know, proper groups and you know, making demos and things. But it totally does not feel like that four years, you know. I remember I saw an interview once, I think it must have been like Parkinson or something, mm -hmm. and he had uh, Tony Curtis on there, and he was celebrating, you know, 50 years in Hollywood or whatever it was. <laughs> and uh, I remember Tony Curtis saying, it feels like I've arrived yesterday, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and the 50 years have just gone like that. And and I can see what, you know, at the time I was like, yeah, whatever, but uh, but I can, uh, you know, I can see what he meant really, you know, it's... Uh, it's all it's just been this continuous thing it's it's all i've done you know since yeah since the present started really uh it's kind of taken over my life to the point where you know it's it's become this obsession i suppose in some ways you know I've, you know never had kids or anything uh and yeah it's it's just you know so, so so i don't look back at those times as a kind of nostalgic thing i also you know look back at them just it's just a bit earlier on in this kind of yeah Continuation of continuation, yeah. Yeah, music career. Yeah, oh, brilliant. Well, Miles says hello, by the way. Because I, uh, I, I asked him, because have you got a question for him? Because I know the interview were coming up later this week. Nothing came to him from the, the top of his mind, but he did thank you for a lovely festival you put him on. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I do my what, own what was that about? I just wanted to ask you about what, what that was, really. Yeah, I do my own festival down here because I live in Brighton mm -hmm. now. And yeah. for the last kind of, I think it's about 10 or 12 years, we've I've you know, got my own little venue on the seafront and we uh, do an annual festival every August. And he came down to play at that a few years ago. And then obviously we couldn't do it uh, during the lockdown yeah. for the obvious reasons. And so so we did like a, a virtual version. So I got, I asked some of the people who played if they, if they could do a little kind of acoustic thing at home, you know, uh, which then we put online and he, he, he kindly, you know, did one for that. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's a, he's a lovely fella. Miles yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, kind of obviously, met him years ago and uh we kind of kept in touch ever since really yeah no it was just a just a pure coincidence that i had that what that this guy that gave me these tapes years ago at school and i'm interviewing you both in the same week it's a bit of a, bit of a <laughs> crazy week for me personally as a music fan to to meet you all this week it's just one of those one of those type of things um so yeah i, I, I had a quick look on wikipedia i don't usually like doing it but it, it, it says that you're from middleton manchester originally yeah. Um, are you close to what's going on in the music scene in Middleton at the minute? Do you know what's going on? At, oh, no, because uh, yeah, I, I actually grew up in Manchester, mm. uh, but and I went to university in, uh, back because I was I was born in Leeds. From yeah. when, when my parents moved to Manchester when I was about three or something, and then I went back to Leeds University. So I've, I've kind of not been in Manchester since 1978. Right, yeah, okay. so I've, not, I've no idea what what the music scene's like sure. anymore. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I just wanted to. Uh, there's quite a lot. There seems to be a lot coming from Middleton. There's a band called the really? Demo that are really good. Uh, there's a band called the Ca the Cavs that are, that get on really well. And I'm actually managing a band called Sinclair that are from Middleton. So I just wanted to pose the question really, just to see if you knew or felt a vibe in that particular area of the world. That's all. It's weird though because you know it's always been you know it's, it's a tiny little kind of suburb really, isn't mm. it? But yeah. just, but at the same time, it's uh, you know the chameleons came from there, didn't they as well? Mm. Yeah. So yeah, it's you know the, I remember when you know I lived there when I was a teenager. You know, there was always a lot going on. There was gigs going on and stuff, and, and you know bands forming and stuff. So yeah, I, it's nice to see that 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 tradition's continued really. 
Was it a, a friend of yours in Chameleons? I can remember seeing in an interview and it was when you, you, one of your friends got signed and then you realised you wanted to go into music. Is that, yeah. is that right? All three of them, actually. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, I knew, yeah, I knew uh, I mean, in the first lineup they had, uh, I knew all four of them, but then they, they changed drummers quite quickly. Hmm. So of the, of, of the other three, I, yeah, I was at school with, uh, I suppose my main person I knew was Dave Field and he was the guitarist. And I, yeah, I went to, he was one of my best friends at school, actually. And then I, but I knew Mark the singer and Revsing the guitarist. And then I went off to university and then they got famous, basically. Right, right. It's the, the pricey of it, really. <laughs> but, yeah, we always wanted to be in bands when we were in bands, each other's bands, for, you know, various times. But then I, I was there studying mathematics at university. Meanwhile, they'd gone down and got appeal sessions, signed to Epic Records. And it's kind of all the things I wanted to do, really. Yeah. And so, it, yeah. It, it, it was a it was a catalyst you know for me i was thinking well if they can do it you know you know i, you know, I can do it as well and uh i mean it took me a, a bit longer because we, we didn't really you know achieve any success until a good like six seven years after that but uh it definitely inspired me to to, to i mean i finished my degree first because i'm yeah. so sensible I was, <laughs> unlike them i was thinking yeah what if it all fails you know, i need something to fall back on so yeah so, you know, i waited until i got my degree really it's quite when it, when I heard that that happened. It's quite a, a thing because you know getting a record deal back in those, those days is completely to get. It's completely different to getting a record deal these days because uh, what is getting a record deal these days really? Sometimes it's <laughs> not worth anything. You, you just get yourself. I don't know. It's just the. I don't, I don't know what it is these days. I can't put my finger on it. But back in those day, days, it was like the holy grail. You know, you, you had some serious backing, and you had, and you were well on your way to in your journey of making a career of it back then we're just looking at you know your friend's band that did it and and how hard it is it all was to get a, a record deal back then what kind of things did you change about what you were doing to uh, to make sure it happened for you i just think I and mean, it wasn't so much about getting a record deal it was it was more like you know taking it seriously i, th- yeah, I okay. think it, it was kind of like uh i wasn't 100 percent committed obviously i was doing a math degree so, so, that, so yeah. time. but but as soon as that that finished, it, it, it became the be all and end all. Really, I think you know I spent a you know, a lot of time. You know, I was uh, you know, uh, you know, I was unemployed. Uh, you know, my parents hated that because obviously I just I just finished university, got this maths degree, I've got you know this great career ahead of me. Actually, no, I'm going to sign on the dole and yeah. uh, be fa- being a you know want to be famous bands kind of thing. So, was there an official conversation about that? Or did it just like uh, you just like I, do it? I, I just did it, and then yeah. every time I was back because because they lived in Middleton still, so every time I used to go yeah. home, they just you know, I mean, quite rightly, obviously, they thought I was completely stupid, and, yeah. and we had these these arguments about it. And in the end, I, I kind of stopped going home because it's, I just knew as soon as I got there, it'd be like, oh, why are you on the dole when you've got a master degree? Which you know is a valid question, yeah. but uh, I think I was just you know fully determined uh, you know, to be in a group. Or, or at least something, you know, to do with music. You know, yeah. I kind of thought, well, if, if the group doesn't work, I'll try and be a DJ or I'll try and, you know, be a music journalist or, you know, or start a record label, anything, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so I kind of spent, you know, the, the whole of my kind of time in you know, writing songs and you know, auditioning drummers and, you know, you know, following this group, which eventually became the wedding present, I suppose. So it's, it, it always fascinates me when people take the journey into the creative uh, industry where there's zero security really <laughs> when people first go into it and it's uh and it's probably one of the most rewarding things if it, if things go okay for you uh, and you get away with it which it, how it can feel sometimes i suppose in the industry uh, it always fascinates me that decision to to, to make that commitment and do it but well, where did where did it span from within within you i think i always wanted to do it you know as and i say want it's not kind of kind of a strong enough word really but from a very early age i was obsessed with music and, and kind of pop culture in general and i used to play my you know parents singles from the 50s and 60s and then i was you know a massive fan of radio one and mm. rock and then punk rock you know and all that stuff and it, and it you know it's my life really and so you know people you know often ask me you know when they decide to be in a band and I can't actually remember, you know, not wanting to be in a band. So, yeah. so it's like, you know, I never made that decision that I'm going to be in a band. It was just, I'm going to be in a band because that's what I, that's what I am. You know, that's what I, I do really. Uh, 
And uh, but yeah, after I finished the, the degree, it became more of a, of a you know of a serious proposition really, rather than just being in a band as a hobby. It was right now. If I really want to do this, I've got to buckle down and do it properly, really. And how, how did you find changing the mindset of others as well, particularly like drummers and that kind of stuff that they've got with, uh, you know, diff- people have got different personalities, people, people have got different um, things going on in their lives. How did you get a group of people to be committed to, to have a go at it? It's, 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 it's the hardest thing, I think. <laughs> yeah. Not being in a band, it's, it's starting a band yeah. because, because obviously you've got no track. I mean, now it's easy because, because we, you know, if, if we need a new, drummer or guitarist we just say look we've got this north american tour lined up and they go yeah i'll do it you know yeah. so it's 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 not a problem but but then obviously you've got nothing you, you, you've got no money you've got a handful of songs and you've got no gigs you, you, know, do you want to be in my band and uh and yeah we went through i think we auditioned 10 drummers in one year until we found someone uh because yeah you know, you've got to have someone who who enjoys the, the same kind of music and who's going to fit in you know with the group really uh it's, yeah it's, it's a struggle really but i guess we did it yeah i can remember when i when i were in a band i think in the, in the later years of it we went through about seven different drummers in 10 years or so mm. something about the personality of your drummer isn't there that's, that's there is fascinating. I'm glad you said it not me <laughs> <laughs> i said it in the nicest way possible as well though <laughs> but they are all a bit mental they are well yeah <laughs> It's certainly been easier to find non-drummers than drummers. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> Brilliant. So, you know, but back in 1992, you as a band decided to release a single every month, which is a very audacious thing to do uh, mm. in, in a year. And, you, and you do, you, you, you're doing it again this year. Yeah. So how, uh, <laughs> I suppose, why is, is, is the first uh, question. <clears throat> well, I think because because we'd done George Preston's first album, then we did Bizarro, then we did Seymour, and I think we kind of felt like it, it, it would be good to do something a bit different, mm. you know. And then you know we didn't know what that would be. And then our bass player at the time, I think he I think he'd just been to New York or something, but it, but he he'd heard about this sub pop singles club. It's a label in Seattle, and and they did this kind of. Uh, uh, like a seven inch club where you know you subscribe to it and every month you get this seven inch single. I think he said, you know, we could do that as a band rather than you know as a label. And we just thought that is such an amazing idea. And in a, in about 15 minutes it was it was all decided, you know, you know, we do more on seven inch vinyl, we do an original on the A side, cover on the B side, yeah. all the sleeves would match. Uh, we do a video for each one, we do a t-shirt for each, you know, it was all this kind of like avalanche of ideas. And once we thought of it, you know, we you know we just thought you know, there's no going back from this. We, you know, we have to do it because it'd be so disappointing now. You know, yeah. and I had a brilliant idea. Uh, you know, to just go back and do an LP. So we so we were we were on RCA at the time. So we just talked to them, and and luckily, our own A and R person was quite high up in the in the hierarchy, so he had a bit of power, and he thought it was a good idea. He, he agreed mm. with it. Was that? Weird noises there, actually. I don't know if you can hear that, but I, I can't hear anything. Myself. It's almost drilling outside. <laughs> okay. uh, and so once they were, you know, were on board, yeah. uh, he said, yeah, let's do it. And uh, yeah, it was, it, I mean, it was a bit audacious, I suppose is the word you use, isn't it? But, you know, it was, it was, a, it was an interesting thing. It was an interesting, it was, it was a different way of, of releasing music mm. for a year. And then when it came to the 30th anniversary, which was, was yeah. you know, this year, I just decided it, but you know, let's do it again, kind of thing. Really, no, I, I love that, and you know, it, just the thought of twelve songs, and you know, getting an album's worth of music ready. I know, I know, you guys are really prolific. Oh, it's twenty-four, really, because it's the B-sides. Oh, twenty-four with the B sides, got twenty with the B sides and uh, and the covers on the other side as well. There, but all all I meant by it was like, you know, producing that amount of music, and when you're writing an album, I suppose. You, you probably might pick different songs for an album than what you might pick for 12 singles over a period of 12 months. I don't know. I'm just trying to think well, there yeah. might be a I mean, different thought process with what you bring out or what you don't, if you do an album or 12 singles over a year. It was a totally different thought process because you know, mm. I think with an album, you just kind of write, don't you, until you've got like like a batch of songs and think, yeah. okay, we've got enough now and we can go and record these you know, make an album. But with, the, but with the Hit Parade and with 24 songs, actually, we've done it over, over time. 
Because you know, both occasions I thought it, it it didn't feel right to have everything kind of written and recorded up front. So, yeah. so we do it in these sections. And so both times we've gone in to the studio like four or five times and done like four or five songs basically. Uh, and it's yeah, so it kind of evolves kind of naturally. You know, uh, it's a bit different every time, and you kind of you kind of build on what you've done before. And so, and the mood changes through the year, really. And it's it's kind of interesting how it works. But so it hasn't got that, you know, like a like an album. Like you know, we've just been playing Sea Monsters actually, which is the third album we've been playing that live, and that's got a certain feel to it like all the way through. There's a mood because all those songs were written together, recorded together, mixed together, and they kind of hold together. Whereas you know, with these singles, it's not. It's it's a single. <laughs> it's you know, it's two songs, and then. Uh, completely you're not connected to the next one really so were the brand new songs written within that month or were the ideas that you've had over the years as well or months before well, parts, you know little recordings here and there with how did you like a lot of them were actually during the lockdown which is one of the reasons why why we did it in the end i think no i'm I mean, just just uh, just staying on the when you did it in 92 i'll come on to when you oh, do no, it this year yeah, uh well yeah funnily enough we had the idea to do it in the kind of maybe like September, October of 1991. Mm. Um, so we didn't have all the songs you know, written. You know, we only had a few written at the time. And so then, so that kind of, you know, rather than, I think it would have been disappointing to say, okay, we're going to do this, but, but we're going to wait a year. <laughs> so, but also I did like the idea of doing it in sections. Yeah, so we just, it was like a process, you know, we wrote, you know, finished writing those songs, went off, recorded them. And then as they were being released, we were writing the next lot and then we recorded that. And we actually worked with four different producers in four different studios uh, over the course, course of the year, really. So it was yeah, a case of you know writing, recording, playing a bit live, and then starting again and doing it, and doing it again four times. So I can remember uh, in an interview I watched, just building up to this uh you know, chat today is that, you you know, during that year, you're on top of the pops four times within the year. And in, in 1992, being on top of the pops is is a massive thing, and there's no music programs like that really at the minute. What mm. what kind of experiences or stories do you have from playing Top of the Pops in 1992? Well, it's funny because you know I grew up with Top of the Pops. Mm, me you too. Know, it, it was it was you know it was a highlight of the week really almost. Uh, but then uh, by the time the wedding present had come into existence. And I kind of, you know, I've been watching some of the, you know, the, uh, the repeats from the eighties and nineties of Top Pops on BBC Four, and and they're terrible. You know, the music, <laughs> the pop music of that era is is not good. I don't think. And I, 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 you know, I think the wedding present. I'm going to shut this window actually because it's annoying me. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's a bloke out there mowing his lawn. That was weird. <laughs> Fair uh, and uh, I think we kind of felt like we were in some kind of kind of anti-top of the box world. Right. Where it was, you know, it was the world of John Peel and Janice Long, and it was the kind of alternative bands and stuff. And uh, I remember The Clash kind of famously, you know, kind of turning it down and thinking, yeah, great. And then the New Order said they'd only if they played live and all that kind of stuff. And then suddenly, you know, we were on it. <laughs> and it was a bit of a shock in a way, because A, you know, I loved it. And then B, I hated it. And then see, I'm on it. So I, I have this love-hate relationship with it. And I'm, you know, if I'm honest, I didn't really take it that seriously at the time. Uh, and you know, we didn't kind of mess around a bit. And I do look like you know, back at some of those videos of us on there and think, you know, we possibly went too far sometimes. But uh, yeah, there's a long history of people like not there taking is. it too seriously on top of the pops, isn't there? I remember when Oasis went brothers one sang and other one did other person's job and that and yeah. <laughs> uh, just I don't know just making it of it just make it like a, a bit of a petition really because they were make that it were, they were making it obvious that they were miming yeah I think a we had a protest type band. thing yeah and I think you know when you saw other bands you took it really seriously and yeah. pretended to mime I just felt like you're just part of the machine you're just part of the game and the, the, you know the, the record industry kind of you know thing so but uh, yeah it was you know but probably, even if it even if it is this big thing top of the pops you know what Hundreds of thousands of people will be watching. Really? Nah, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take the piss here. I'm just a young lad playing music. It's not really. I'm not that bothered. I'm playing it cool. I think that was, like, 
it's kind of an element of that to it, yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, me, me no. It just fascinates me that, that, that these little things of yeah. music history and what goes on there. So, so yeah. So, so you, so you embarked on this new idea to do it in 1992. So, doing you, you're doing it again this year. Has, has yeah. it been easier to do it this year because you've done it before and you've got these years of experience behind you and you know what you know you've probably got a better idea of how to streamline processes and, and get work completed has it, yeah, has it been easier yeah. for you this year than I suppose, I suppose it has been easier for that yeah, could be, yeah, yeah we know what, you know, what we're doing and i think you know weirdly it's exactly the same because yeah. you know we had these like like means how we should you know, should we do it and uh in the end we decided let's do a seven inch single every month which is exactly what it was you know, 30 years ago. Uh, I think the main difference is, well, there's two main differences. One is there's, you know, there's no record shops anymore, really. Yeah. So uh, when we uh, we did it you know, with RCA, you know, the only place you bought them was in your local, like, you know, Woolworths or our price or whatever, you know. Uh, whereas now it's down to this kind of selects, you know, specialist shops. So somebody told me our price is coming back the other day. That's just come Really? To Interesting. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I was stopped you for that. Just came to me. Cool. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, yes. But, uh, well, actually, actually, you know, having said that, vinyl is back, isn't it? You know, you get yeah. the records opening up now, and there's it's young people in there. It's not old blokes like me anymore. So that's interesting. Uh, pop, so we pop in Manchester. I, I, I went down just to buy a few records recently, and that's my favourite record place in Manchester, in town. And it, and you're right, it's just it was so so busy, and people just doing the old school thing and just taking your time. You know, they're just looking through the records and just spending an hour in there easily. Just chilling out, and you know, speaking that's what we've lost, isn't it? With the, yeah. the streaming and all that, yeah, you you've lost that flicking through the thing and looking at the sleeve and picking it up and taking, you know, yeah. and that's all part of the ritual, really. But what we did this time, because of, because of, of the lack of record shops, we had to do like a subscription service as well, so so you could you get by mail order, which we didn't do thirty years ago. Yeah. And the second change is the turnaround times, because I remember when we did it the first time, you know, admittedly we had the you know the. RCA's massive kind of record making machine behind us, but we were you know, recording them, mixing them, and then they were out like three weeks later in the shops, you know, they were pressed, printed for sale. Whereas this time, because of you know the lack of, uh, of record pressing plants, we've had to do it like seven months in advance or something. So it was kind of all shifted back, you know, half a year really. But uh, apart from that, it's been the same process. Oh, Dad, I really, you know love seeing this kind of process and one thing that you uh, that you've done again is have is co co collaborate with people for the b-sides again um so how was that process compared to 1992 doing it well, this year we haven't really collaborated I'm no. not sure what you mean. do you mean the songwriting um uh, yeah well, that, that, on some of the b-sides this year are they are you not collaborating with the, like with sleeper and that kind of stuff well, basically, that's because our guitarist John is actually also in Sleeper. Oh, uh, okay, right. I've got mixed up there. Okay, got you. Yeah, no, he joined. He joined a couple of years ago. Hmm. And one of the, 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 uh, sorry, joined the whatever is not Sleeper. He's, a, he's actually a founder member of Sleeper. Okay. And uh, yeah, when our you know, we had a, a vacancy for a guitarist, and he was recommended to me. And, you know, met him, and he was a wedding present fan. So we thought, yeah, perfect, really. And then he. When I first met him, he played me this demo of a, of a sleeper song, which was from years ago, which he'd never used. Mm. I said, "That's a really good song. You know, we should, you know, uh, do a version of it." So basically, uh, he asked Louise Wenner to to sing on our version as well, and so, so, so yeah, that was just. But that, I think that's the only col collaboration that we've had really. I mean, we've had different people writing the songs over the over the year, but. Uh, yeah, so, so like I, I imagine then just just because of what you mentioned with, you know, just how hard work it is to get vinyl from anywhere these days. Mm. Uh, this year, you know, the, the writing process to bring a single out were, were the songs written last year for you to have oh, the, the thing, to yeah. rest and stuff. It was in the it was it was during the lockdown. lockdown really. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah when it started, and uh, obviously I couldn't, you know, I couldn't. You know, we weren't physically together, but but John was. John and, and Melanie, actually, the bass player, were sending me all these files of, of demos with, uh, with loads of ideas. So a lot of them were kind of written over the last couple of years, really, kind of half written, you know, mm. and, and we yeah, finished them off together as a band. But uh, it's funny because when we did the hit parade, obviously the, the, it was half originals and half covers, and I kind of assumed that, that it would be the same if we did it again, really. Yeah. 
And then I, I suddenly, you know, we and there are a couple of covers. Obviously, there's the Sleeper song, and we also did a magazine song on on the second single. Uh, but then I kind of I was thinking, but we've got like twenty of our own songs here. <laughs> why are we why are we struggling thinking of, of covers and arranging covers when we you know, we should just record our own songs? Mm -hmm. So so that's yeah, that's the difference, I suppose. This time it's it's been you know it's it's twenty wedding present songs and two two covers really. Being so prolific as you are, do you ever get a chance to switch off? You must have, you must have just have music ideas all the time. It feels like, you no, know, to be yeah. to be that prolific and be able to do these type of projects must be. I don't, I don't switch off. Curse. I think that's probably a problem. You know, yeah. I, I think there's people who say that uh, uh, they had a good lockdown, but I definitely did, to be honest with you, because yeah. there's loads of stuff that I got done. You know, <laughs> get, yeah. we do play live quite a lot, you know, all around the world, really. And when suddenly we had these like couple of years where we, we couldn't do anything uh, you know, outside of the home, you know, I was writing songs. I was working on the second volume of the autobiography. Uh, you know, we did a compilation of Bond themes for, for like a benefit album, and yeah, you know, even even doing stuff like you know YouTube. You know, we did a YouTube site uh, years ago and then left it, and so so we updated that. So there's always little admin things as well, but. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm a bit of a workaholic, really. I suppose is, 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 is a simple answer. Do, you, do the songs find you, or do you have to sit down and proper wait for them to arrive? How, how does it work for you as an, an artist? To be honest, I'm usually, I'd say nine times, well, probably ninety-five percent of the time, I start with somebody else's little riff. Really, uh, it'll be it'll be John sent me a few guitar parts and, and, and sometimes it will be like almost a complete song really and sometimes it'll just be a, you know like a, what do you think about this for a verse kind of thing mm. or melanie will do the same and then i'll go away and uh kind of kind of work on that you know kind of you know work out my bit and then work out the the, the vocal work out the lyric and everything uh but it's, it's different with every song as well you know sometimes you know the title comes first almost uh, you know kind of look for something which would approach that to, be appropriate for that title then often it'll be the a melody or a, or a lyric or a guitar part or a, a bass line you know it, it could be anything really so the hit parade is out now uh was it 24th september it came out so it, it's out now for yeah, people to enjoy really, uh, really, just, yeah. just with everything I'll, I'll put a link on the description of this podcast for for people to click on it and and find it find it out so how, how much how, how how does it feel to have you know that piece of art a, a new hit parade compared to you know just looking back over 30 years it just must be it must be a really proud moment to to look back on that body of work and then produce this new body of work too uh, well yeah uh, you know <laughs> okay, <fair enough. laughs> i don't know what to say <laughs> fair enough <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, I'm, yeah I'm proud of i'm proud of the, of the original series and i'm proud of the new one really it's but if, if uh, you're born in yorkshire that, that that that's that's a big thing because i'm from sheffield originally when, yeah. when, when i think something's all right that's like you know that's amazing for a yorkshireman i suppose we just played in sheffield actually we just played oh, at yeah, yeah we oh, just nice. played. i played at the lead mill for the 21st time uh just last oh. weekend so yeah first time was 1986. <laughs> Wow, and, and how how was the the Sheffield crowd? How did it take? How did it take to, you know, you guys again? I've got to say, you know, it it felt like a really good concert. You know, sometimes you can just feel that everything's like going well, and uh, it was sounding good, and the crowd were up for it. And then afterwards, pe you know, people inside the band and outside the band, and you know, social media was saying that is one of the best concerts I've ever seen you play. So. I don't know why it was, but you know, sometimes it just all comes together. I mean, you know, we've been doing Sea Monsters uh, shows, it's kind of 30th anniversary, and we've been, and we've been playing it kind of all year, really, because a lot of them are kind of postponed from you know yeah. uh, lockdown periods and stuff. So, so we should know it back to front, really. So it, it's tight, you know, and it's well rehearsed. And we just came back from the European tour. We played it every night, and so I think you know we didn't have that kind of still fumbling for the notes or, you know, yeah. which pedal goes on, you know, it was all, you know, second nature. And I think once you get to that level, you kind of almost tra you know, transcend, you know, the physical aspects of doing the concert and it, and just, you know, you, you, you're more focused on, on something else really, which is bigger. And uh, yeah, it, it just, it just really worked. It just came out really, and, and the Lebanon is such a great place, you know. It, it doesn't feel right that it's at risk. Uh, you know, on the link to our podcast, we've got, uh, the, you know, we're supporting, you know, save the lead mill till we die. Um, you know, there's a petition on our on on our website everywhere. You can find this petition to save the lead mill, the 
So how, how how much of a loss would it be to you to see that venue go if it did, if worst case scenario happened? I don't think it can go. Surely not. Oh, because, oh, because, you know, you hear about these venues, you know, disappearing and, you know, become block of flats, but, but they, you know, with respect, they haven't got that status that the, you know, the Lebnall's got, have they really? That, that is, you know, ever since I've, I've been in a band, it's, it's, it's been the lead mill, you know, yeah. it's been an iconic venue. Really. Something about that room and the horrible hangovers you get from the cheap vodka. Yeah. I've spent many nights in that place and love and adore that building. Um, yeah. I'm just glad that other people have the same kind of affinity, affinity to it than what us local Sheffielders do too. I've got a piece of the dance floor. Cause, cause when I, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, they kind of redid the dance floor. Mm. Of years yeah. Ago. They cut it up and sell little, uh, yeah, little did, did you get a piece? Oh, nice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. Love that. Love that. Yeah. Save the Lebnall. Yeah. Just, just on the Lebnall guys, if you listen to the podcast, uh, in our link tree, you can sign the petition to save the Lebnall as well and show your support. That's great. So, um, so, you know, through the years of music and everything, David, um, I know you've got an autobiography coming out. So how, how have you, how, how have you prepared for that? Or haven't, have you, or haven't you, you know, have, have you got snippets through the years? Have you got, did you, did you do a diary? How, how did you, like come to is is it even about the band? It's got to be, well, sure. Yeah, it's about it's, it's basically. Uh, I mean, it evolved actually because when it was actually Terry DeCastro Castro was the bass player in in my other band, Cinerama, hmm. and then she was in the Wedding Britain as well. Like, so, so she'd been in the band for years, and she had this idea to do my biography from her point of view, as in kind of meeting me and then you know what. Like, asking me questions, asking my parents questions, all that kind of stuff. And so she started doing it and it, it kind of never, it never came to fru fruition actually. And then she left the band. And then we just thought, you know, actually there were some elements of, of that, which uh, because I'm a big comic book fan. So I wanted uh, uh, to speak, you know, some graphic, you know, elements to, to her biography. And and we ended up kind of coming to the idea that, that we'd kind of relaunch the idea but completely as a as a graphic novel kind of thing. So we started doing these comics called Tales from the Wedding Present. And basically, in answer to your question, it, it's just conversations, really. It's just her yeah. saying, you know, oh, didn't you do that? You know, didn't you go there once? And I'm going, yeah, well, that reminds me of a funny story, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then and then we kind of make that into, into one story. And sometimes they're a couple of pages long, sometimes they're 12 pages long. And then we send them to my friend, uh, Lee Thacker, who's a is a is a cartoonist, and he he makes his comic book out of it. And uh, so we did the comic, you know, just as a little hobby, really, for the last kind of decade now. And then we decided to compile them into these chronological uh, volumes, hardback books. And we did volume one two years ago, uh, it, which launched at the virtual version of, of the Louder Than Words Festival. Yep. And then we're doing volume two at the, at the real festival this year in, in November. So, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, um, yeah, I think the first one went from kind of, you know, my childhood up to the, the band, I think probably the first single. And then, and the second one is, is the next kind of few years after that. So we do George Best and, uh, I think we're looking at signing to RCA and stuff, but uh, it's just an ongoing, you know, I love doing it. Yeah. I actually prefer doing it to, to making records, to be honest with you. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's more fun. Yeah, it's, I can imagine. It, it's a lot easier, but it's, uh, and it's great, you know, we, you know, me and Terry kind of bat these ideas around, kind of based on a conversation and then put it into text and then it's sent it to Lee. And then it comes back with his drawings and it's suddenly there you are in in this world, this comic book world. It's mm. like a storyboard of a film or something. And it's, uh, he really brings it to life. So is there, a, is there a story that you could share us from, from the book that didn't get into it? Like, is there, is there a story that just didn't no. like make no, a book that you could share with us? I don't know. I'm trying to ease all, the book a bit. I know they all go in it really. Uh, it's okay. kind of, it's kind of a warts and all. I mean, I've got to be honest with you. I don't. I don't come across in, you know, in a good light all the way through it. Yeah. But, but I think that's part of it. You know, I suppose if I was writing it totally on my own in in a traditional sense, because you hear these stories, don't you? I was, I was reading the other night, the, the other day about uh, Bobby Gillespie's biography. I've I've not read it, but apparently some of the early members of, of Primal Scream were kind of saying that's not how it happened at all. You know, that, that's, <laughs> yeah, he's making yeah. that up, you know, to make himself look good. Yeah. And I think if you are kind of writing your own book from that point of view, yes, maybe you would do that. You know, you kind of, you know, not mention the, the bad things. 
but with this, it, it's not kind of like that because it's more of a collaborative thing, I suppose. And uh, uh, you know, Terry's very happy to uh, to you know take a piss, right. basically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, how, how was that as a human? You know, hearing that back again, does, does it make you a better person somehow? I don't know if it makes you a better person. I don't know. You, just, you, know, you feel bad about what you've done, about certain things you've done. Yeah, you've done. fair enough. It's weird though because someone was saying what's the difference between writing the book and writing the songs, and with the songs you can hide hide behind it a little bit. Yes. You say, well, you know, yeah. it's based on a real situation, but yeah, I might have kind of changed changed it a bit to make it rhyme or you know, to yeah. whatever. But but with the book, you know, it's an autobiography, so it definitely happened. And you know what you're seeing, you know, what you really did that. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean, it's it's uh, so it's it's a different kind of feeling, really, but. You know, it, at the end of the day, it's, it's a comic book as well. So we're not going to be, you know, you know, not yeah. really nasty about anybody or anything. It's more kind of a, yeah, you know, it's realistic, but it's, it's. I wouldn't say lighthearted. I, I can't, th I can't think what the word is really. You know, it's not, uh, it's not vindictive about, any, about yeah. anything. It, it, it just surprised me how prolific you are, David, mate. You know, it just and and, and the, your passion for it just flo just just shows um, it, that that must be the question I was going to ask you uh, as we draw this interview to a close a little bit. Is it, what's the what's the secret to a long term career? But I think you've answered it already, just with how enthusiastic you are <laughs> with it all. <laughs> you know, is that a fair assessment? Well, I used to say that, that I'm obsessed with it, but I th but it, you know, obsession is a kind of a mental illness, and I, I feel like okay. you know, I shouldn't be saying that because it doesn't. <laughs> Right, that you know, I've got this mental illness, but but it is kind of that, really. You know, yeah. like, as I said before to you, I'm a bit workaholic. I'm I'm very meticulous, mm -hmm. and I don't mind I don't mind working really, which is which is uh, you know, and if there's nothing to do, I kind of find something to do. <laughs> you yeah. know, and yeah. I, yeah, so I guess that's why it's lasted. No, I really appreciate your time today. Have you got a message to share with the wedding present fans that haven't pressed the button yet on buying the hit parade or, um, you know, they're thinking about coming to a few gigs in, in the future? Well, they they probably already them? got it. They probably got it the first time it came out and or one, of the, you know, one of the other Fair enough. various re-releases of it. But, uh, but this year, fans will buy it again, won't they? I think that's what it, I mean, I mean, you know, it's uh, it's actually done by RCA again, which is nice because it's the original one. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they did a new package with all with artwork from all the, the yeah. original singles and stuff. So it's nice. But then I would say that, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, I really appreciate your time, mate. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. I love hearing the stories of, you know, such as somebody that's had that's that's had the holy grail really of having a career in the music industry that a lot of bands and young bands that i uh, i have on at gigs in manchester down at gulliver's you know that they they're all searching out this holy grail of trying to uh create a career within music and it's great to um you know just to have these chats with you know people like yourselves that have, that have made it through uh <laughs> unscathed made it through, yeah. <laughs> made it through. Well, yeah fair enough fair enough uh, but yeah mate, really appreciate your time and thanks again for joining us today. Thanks, David. thank you